Thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Intelligence Squared discussion on the war in Ukraine, one that, despite the eye-catching troubles of the British government right now, could not be better timed, nor could it have a finer cast. The title of the discussion is the fabulously pompous fulcrum of history. The topic is the key. What are the lessons that history can teach us about the Russian war in Ukraine? And to address that question, we have three wonderful guests. We have hopefully a wonderful audience, uh, <laughs> some great questions, and perhaps most importantly, a decent amount of time to chew over the questions and the answers as they come. There's always a slightly ghastly moment now where I sing the praises of our panel as they have to sit there and squirm, but we will plunge right in. Sir Max Hastings is a journalist, a broadcaster, an author of more than 30 books, former editor of the Daily Telegraph, former editor of the Evening Standard, contributor to nearly every national newspaper there is. And his latest book, which will be available in the foyer, um, is Abyss, the Cuban Missile Crisis 1962. We may be hearing a little on that topic as the evening goes on. Margaret Macmillan is Professor of History at the University of Toronto, Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford, BBC Reef Lecturer, and her most recent book is War, How Conflict Shaped Us. Peter Frankopan is Professor of Global History at the University of Oxford. His most recent book is The New Silk Roads, The Present and Future of the World. That is our panel. Thank you. I, I didn't squirm at all. <laughs> um, very briefly on the format of this evening, the first 45 minutes will be given over to me lobbing questions at the panel. Uh, after that, there'll be roughly the same amount of time, about 40 minutes for you to lob questions at the panel. There are standing mics. You should be able to see them. Standing microphone there and there and then. I can't quite see it because I'm blinded by the lights up in the gallery there as well. Um, so I'm the, the best thing to do, I'm afraid, is to sort of go to the microphone and wait to be called. Um, uh, it's just otherwise we have intolerable delays as people make their way to the mics. We don't have roaming mics. For those of you watching at home, there is a box beneath the screen in which you can see us all. Uh, you can type your questions in there and then I will see them here and put those to the panel as well. And we hope to get through as many questions as we possibly can. I would urge you to put questions rather than statements to the panel. Um, it generally produces a better reaction. But that all having been said, I would like to extend my thanks again to our panel for coming here this evening. My thanks to you and let us begin. The first question, um, I'll put it, if I may, to you, Margaret. Are we fighting the Third World War? No, I don't think we are. And I think it's actually a very unhelpful analogy. I think it leads to panic. It leads to thinking about this war in a way that we shouldn't be thinking about it. At the moment, what we're seeing is a state-to-state -state war between Ukraine and, and Russia. It has, of course, the potential to turn into something wider. It already has drawn in outside forces, outside support. Um, and so it certainly has the potential to develop into something wider. But this is not a world war yet. And I think we should hope very much that it won't become one. Um, the two world wars, we should remember, were absolutely devastating in their impact. The Second World War, even more, if that's possible, than the First World War, because it involves such large parts of Asia as well. And a Third World War, given the types of weapons we have today, really has the potential to polish us all off. And so I think, I'm not saying we shouldn't contemplate it, but I think to call this the Third World War is wrong because it's not that, and let's say a prayer that it won't be that yet. Max. Um, I agree with Margaret um, that it isn't the Third World War. I do think what we're discovering from this um, horrible regional conflict is we're being reminded uh, that we live in a perpetual nuclear age, that uh, for 30 years since the end of the Cold War in 1991, We've all behaved almost as if nuclear weapons had been uninvented, as if they weren't there. Now, what this crisis has reminded us, partly because President Putin has made it his business to remind us, um, is that those nuclear weapons, Putin still has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. 
Now, I entirely agree with Margaret, this is not the Third World War, but on the other hand, the potential, as long as you're dealing with nuclear weapons, for something horrible to happen is still there. And it, when people talk sometimes some of the very bellicose rhetoric one hears about Russia, um, I think, Reversing, I've just published a book um, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and to me, the one lesson that, that lasts from that one is that President Kennedy and the Missile Crisis displayed a mixture of resolution and caution. And what I think the Americans have been doing very well in this crisis is to display the same mixture of absolute commitment to Ukraine and the resolution. But also, I don't think anybody in Washington forgets the caution bit of the fact that as long as we're dealing with nuclear armed states, you always have to be incredibly careful to prevent this from becoming something worse. Peter. Well, I suppose if, if, uh, if Margaret's wrong, we're not going to live to see the consequences. So that's a, always a good answer to have, isn't it? If this is the beginning of the Third World <laughs> War um, and it escalates in a way that are the worst case scenarios, that really is it. Um, I, I suppose as a historian, the question would be if, if we let's say the survivors in a cave, we'd say, when did it begin? Uh, because it didn't begin on the 24th of February, 2022. Uh, you could plausibly argue, I think, for a, for a good mark that 2014 was when this started, when Russia invaded Ukraine and occupied it. We did nothing, that's a separate story, and we can talk about that. Uh, you could argue it was maybe 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia, and again, we didn't really do what we should have done. Or you could argue that it sort of really the seeds were sown at the end of the Cold War as the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union dissolved. And, and that's how the Russians want to frame this, right? So what Putin, Gorbachev, who died uh, a month ago or so now, uh, were adamant that the seeds of all of the confrontations were sown by the way in which Russia was treated after the war began, after the wall came down, rather. And so I think we have to be very careful to, first of all, work out what exactly we're looking at. You know, is this a localized conflict where Putin has tried to make a quick land grab? Is this something much more profound, much more existential, that is about the West, it's about uh, conquests of large patches of territory? And where do, we, where do we carve that up? And I think we haven't thought that through particularly well, part, partly because we're so busy with the logistical problem of keeping the Ukrainian army supplied. Margaret, can I, can I ask you about this question of a hybrid war? Because I suspect the answer to the World War III question slightly depends on, on where you sit, doesn't it? If you are in Russia and you see economic sanctions from the West, you see military supplies from the West flooding into Ukraine, you see a constant to and fro in the battle for opinion, you might think that the West is pretty heavily involved in this war, that it's not just a regional conflict as it's been described here. Well, there's a difference, I think, between taking measures that are warlike and actually fighting. And the West at the moment isn't fighting Russia, although it is certainly doing its best to support those who are fighting Russia. So I don't think yet it is a, it is a third world war. And, and we don't know. I mean, what we have to hope, I think, is that it doesn't develop. And, and as Peter said, we, we don't know when it started, really. And with any war, you can go back, and you can go back, and you can go back. And you could go back to, actually, go back to 1917, um, when the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia and right. sent Russia down a particular path, um, yeah. deeply suspicious of its neighbors, but wanting to reconstitute the Tsarist Empire. But what I think we have to worry about always is, is the, the, the possibility of accident as well. You know, we, we have too many, well, we have too many possibilities for something to go wrong. You know, in Europe, I think, if the first, sec first World War hadn't happened, people would have said, oh, it was just like the crisis in 1912 and 1913, and we didn't get a, a full out, all out war. Mm. And I think a lot of people mm. don't want an all out war, but the danger always is when you get armed forces in close contact with each other. I mean, what if the Russians, for their own reasons, drop a tactical, well, a nuclear weapon. I, I, I agree with Lawrence Friedman. I don't think they're tactical. If you use a nuclear weapon, a threshold has been crossed. But what if the Russians were to drop something on Poland? What, what happens then? What, how would the, would the Poles respond? How would the West respond? And so I think we have to be, at this moment, very, very careful. Um, we're dealing with a possibility. And I think Max is right. We, you know, there's a lot of bellicose talk. Um, 
often by those who aren't actually fighting. It's always easier to say we should fight to the last Ukrainian um, when we're not actually fighting. But I think we are in a, in a very dangerous situation, and we have this combination of very high-tech war. I mean, you mentioned nuclear weapons. There's also biological war. There's mm. chemical war. Um, the cyber war. You know, we've already seen in, in the north of Germany last week. The whole train system was out because someone hacked the, the, German, the German system. And all those underwater cables which carry, the fiber optic cables which carry the, the communications among banks, all the things we depend on, are so vulnerable now. We're, we're realizing just what could happen. Can I try one historical parallel on you two? That an awful lot of people today are saying, we should never have allowed the Russians to get this far. Um, we should have had Ukraine in NATO. Um, we should have intervened in 2014. I don't think the West should ever reproach itself for having tried extraordinarily hard to embrace Russia as a, a partner in the community of civilized nations. And I do see a parallel with 1938. Yeah. That some, in, in my view, sensationalist historians today argue that um, the Western Allies should have gone to war against Hitler in 1938, um, at the time of Munich. Now, I don't agree at all, partly because in those days, an awful lot of people all over the world still were not convinced that Hitler had to be fought, still were not convinced that um, it was necessary to have, take, participate in another huge war. By 1939, that had changed, that um, the Western Allies were able to go into World War II extraordinarily united because there was an understanding that everything had been tried um, to, to strike civilized deals with Hitler and it had all failed. That Hitler was a man with whom you couldn't do business. And I think something of the same is true today, that, um, that there is a clear understanding today, as there was not, there would not have been in 2014, that Putin is an extraordinarily dangerous, and I'm very reluctant to use the word, but yes, evil force in the world. Um, and that he's got to be resisted and fought. And I believe that there's a better chance of the West being able to stand united against Putin today than there would have been um, if we'd gone up against Putin earlier, or if there'd been, I, I think it's crazy to talk of having had Ukraine and NATO, because I think it would have been so divisive a year or two ago. But I don't know, what do you... Well, so, so Ukraine's application to join NATO was turned down in 2010. So there was no sort of, uh, there was a, a, a attempt to want to join, and one could perhaps understand why. I, I don't I don't disagree with anything you say, Max. The, the only thing I would say is, is that um, in the 1994 Be Budapest Mem Memorandum, under which Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, um, uh, United States, Russia, the Russian Federation, and the United Kingdom guaranteed Ukraine's territorial integrity. And that is a problem in 2014, that under Obama and under the Cameron administration here in the United Kingdom, we fudged what was going on about what those commitments actually meant. Max, can I pick you up on nuclear? Because yeah. it comes round to the book you've just published, yeah. doesn't it? The Given Missile Crisis. And we've seen a lot of chat over the last, what, 10 days about that situation. What are the parallels? Are there parallels? With well, there are the, only the, the good news today. Um, in what the world was terrified of in 1962, where there was going to be general war between the West and the Soviet Union, um, which would have obviously been a catastrophe of the planet because it meant nuclear war. And one thing we have caused, uh, Jack Kennedy has become a very controversial figure, especially in the United States today, um, especially because of his treatment of women. Um, well, for this, for purposes of talking about this crisis, I don't think we need to go, go there. What we can say, is Kennedy displayed in 1962 um, extraordinary wisdom in seeing from a very early stage that um, at all costs, um, nuclear exchanges, terrifying to read the, uh, the transcripts, to listen to the audio tapes of uh, the first day meeting in the White House when they discuss what they're going to do. And the first mood, the mood of the American armed forces was, we've got to bomb Cuba and invade Cuba and take on the Russians. And the American armed forces chiefs were gagging to do that. And um, somebody said, well, what happens if we do invade Cuba? And uh, um, the view was that probably the Russians would take out West Berlin, which was then an enclave in, in Europe. And Robert Kennedy said, well, then what do we do? And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at this meeting um, said, to, said, he said, go to general war, I guess, if it's in the interest of ours. And said, Kennedy said, nuclear exchange? And General Maxwell Taylor said, guess you have to. 
And thank God, John F. Kennedy had the sense to say, yes, yes, I mean, and worse things, I even had one worse things were said. But John F. Kennedy said at that first meeting, he said, um, we all have to understand that nuclear exchange will be the final failure. The final failure. He said, everything we do here has got to be directed towards seeing that we don't get there. Um, now, today, I don't think we're in anything like, without rehearsing the whole crisis, I think that one thing that is scary is Jack Kennedy was able to see in 1962 scope for a bargain with Khrushchev, in particular, what the way the deal was finally struck, that the Americans formally undertook not to invade Cuba, um, then or ever, and privately and secretly, Kennedy promised Khrushchev he'd remove um, American nuclear weapons uh, from Turkey. Um, now today, it is much more difficult. Tens of thousands of people have died as a result of Khrushchev's, uh, of um, uh, Putin's aggression. Um, it is far more difficult to see the basis of any sort of bargain that either President Zelensky or uh, uh, President Biden can strike uh, that won't be rewarding Putin's aggression. So I think it is, I, I think this crisis is less dangerous, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I think it's more difficult to see the path out of. Margaret, can I get, pick up on a point that Max made there, or that, that Max illuminated, and that's the role of human beings in international relations, because so much of the discussion seems to treat uh, the actors as rational actors. Um, are they? No, it, it, it's the same sort of fantasy, that, yeah. sorry, Thank you. Um, as, as the rational economic being, mm. you know, that we all make rational economic decisions based on full information and, and think things through. Um, you know, it's a convenient thing to have if you're de developing these theories, but where I think a lot of the realist political scientists, the people who say it's all about interest, you can just simply measure it, and it's, your states always behave in a certain way because of their interest. Whoever's in charge, it doesn't really matter. I think they leave out the individual, they leave out the role of emotion often. And I think we would not have had this war. I mean, if this war doesn't show how you need to bring in the role of individuals. If you have someone in office who has a great deal of power, what that person wants, what that person does is going to make a difference. You know, um, a British prime minister, particularly at the moment, doesn't seem to have a great, of, great deal of power. Um, <laughs> and so perhaps it doesn't matter who's in office, but it does actually matter who's in charge of China. It does matter who's in charge of Russia because they have built or they've risen to the top of a system in which the, those office holders have a great deal of power. And I think we wouldn't have had a war in Ukraine without Putin. I think this is Putin's war. And I think the role of emotion, I think we're also realizing how important it is. I mean, when people looked at the relative size of, of the Russian and, and Ukrainian forces, they thought, well, there's no way that, that Ukraine can hold out for more than two days, which is what the Russians, of course, thought. They thought it was going to be a cakewalk down to Kiev, and they apparently had a, a puppet government. And in addition to their dress uniforms, they actually had an actual live puppet government in that long train that was coming down on Kiev. And we all, I think, and I, I was guilty of it as well, and the Russians certainly did, we left out the determination of the Ukrainians who were fighting an existential war to, to survive. Hmm. Peter? Well, it helped that the Russian army was supremely incompetent. Yeah. Uh, badly led, they didn't understand basic logistics, uh, they hadn't realised when they'd done all these training exercises that they do with great show, often with partners from, from other countries, um, that, their, that their tanks had much lower mileages than they thought they did, and so you had this 70 mile queue because you couldn't get vehicles to the front. So I mean, I think that's right. I think with, with Putin, the problem is, is not emotional acting, it's being a bad actor. And Putin, as all opportunists are, and as Hitler was and many other leaders in history, uh, is, a, is, a, is an opportunist. And you can see why he thought things would play out in a different way. He know? thought we were weak. He th well, it's, it starts with, with uh, absolutely right. I mean, it starts with Margaret, with the, all the intelligence reports from Ukraine, with that he'd be welcome with open arms. In fact, intelligence of Russian and FSB intelligence officers in Kiev had chosen the apartments that they'd move into after the great uh, conquest. He was absolutely certain that Ukraine's, Ukraine's had no fighting spirit, let alone competence. But beyond that, he looked at Europe post-pandemic, economically stressed. He could see the chaos of Brexit, which is almost incomprehensibly crap how we've been as a country in terms of the leadership, regardless of our political persuasions or whether you're pro-Brexit, I'm not here for that. Mm. But no one can argue that we have had strong and stable leadership in the last three or four years. And on top of that, we've had 
um, all the kinds of disagreements where we've, we've detached from the rest of the world to solve our own problems, that that's opportunity for a permanent member of the Security Council is a challenge. Uh, you could see Macron calling NATO brain dead as quite a clear signal. You could see the incompetence of the way that the United States ditched Britain and its partners to pull out of Afghanistan and the way in which that was done with US Marines smashing keyboards to try and make them unusable and taking parts off very expensive pieces of kit. You, you can see Poland and Hungary effectively either being or about to be sanctioned by the EU. And you'd probably take a view that you'd, fight, you'd face very little resistance, particularly if you can see what happened in 2014. So Putin gambled on all of that. And through a series, because of, as Margaret said, an authoritarian structure that is extremely slim, there's no institutional protection any way up, the whole way up, you can see why he threw the dice and thought he was absolutely bound to win. And like most opportunist gamblers, you, you can win often, but if you get it wrong, you get it really, really badly wrong. I think one thing we don't... Um, sorry, Margaret. No, after you. Yeah, go on. I, one thing we don't hear enough about, and we don't say enough ourselves, we all owe an extraordinary debt of gratitude to the United States that without the Americans, um, nobody should kid themselves, um, Ukraine would by now be toast. If Ukraine was dependent upon European assistance, military and economic, and although we talk a lot about this quantity of weapons we've sent, it's nothing compared with the Americans. And I think our leader should be saying to Washington, should be expressing extraordinary gratitude to Washington and should be making the Americans feel that we understand what we owe them. Because another president in the White House might have behaved completely differently. Mm. And, um, and, oh yes, and we, might, we may in 2024 have another president. We've got to start in Europe taking security seriously. We cannot rely on the Americans always bailing us out. And by gosh, they have bailed us out this time around. No, I, I agree with you. And I think, what if Donald Trump had been president? What if, what if he had actually won the election? Uh, you know, but he would have been congratulating Putin, his new best friend, and saying, what a great victory. Um, but just to go back to what Peter was saying about Russian assumptions and, and Putin himself, I mean, there is a terrible thing that, you know, it, it's, it, all dictators should be warned about this. The longer you stay there, the more isolated you get, the more you'll only hear from people who are flattering you to tell you what you want. I'm sure a lot of the intelligence failures were people telling him what he wanted to hear. I mean, if you're an FSB agent, if you said to, if you sent a note, a report back to Moscow saying, by the way, a lot of Ukrainians actually probably will fight for the country, well, that would have been the end of your career. Mm. And so I think Putin had convinced himself. And there's also a really interesting element here. He thought the West was decadent. And have you noticed how often he talks about gender and he talks about same-sex marriage and he talks about transgender? You know, there's, there's something really deeply weird there. But I think he, he had convinced himself <laughs> that, no, I think this, you know, the fact that he fixes on it, um, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm not going to get into Putin's psychology because that would be like getting into Hades. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think, I think there, there was that assumption. And again, it's, it's what people have in their minds when they do something. And I think he had certain things his mind was going to be easy. The West wouldn't do anything. And now that the West has responded and now that Ukraine has responded so effectively uh, and shown such military military prowess. He's stuck. What does he do now? Peter, you want to... Yeah, I think I was going to say, I mean, without following, following you down to the circle of hell and, and want a glass of wine on, as, as we sit and talk to talk about that one, I think Putin's psychology is partly the wheel decadent, but that's framed the, and from his perspective, so far as we can tell, from the idea that Russia is the last bastion of decency, civilization, and so on. And that has run through since he took office or took power at the end of the 90s. It's been a constant theme of Russia seeing itself as the last place standing, as the third Rome, is in a really important part of Russian historiography and sort of myth-making of, you know, Rome fell and then it was, the baton was passed to Constantinople, the new Rome, and Moscow is the third Rome, the heir of the Orthodox traditions and so on, that there is a kind of very powerful motif in using history in that way to try to, to frame what it is that, that Putin is trying to do. And, you know, for what it's worth, and I mean, I hope we also talk a little bit about d deeper history or history further back, all my colleagues who worked on medieval Kiev and Kievan Rus, sort of from the 9th, 10th, 11th century, all lost their jobs 10 years ago. You know, this wasn't something that has just popped up in the last year or two, or even since 2014. The sensitivity around who the Ukrainians are, where they fit within Russia's idea of the outside world. And, you know, I mean, it's a matter of interest. I can't really see everybody's hands. But how, how many people, and I'm not going to point at you, know that Putin wrote these crazy essays about history? Right. 
Everybody. How many people actually read those essays? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, okay. So, you know, okay. Putin, it's sort of slightly unusual, this long essay about Dmitry Bliansk, which is pretty arcane knowledge, or the, the way in which Polish nobles were awarded with, with land holdings. I mean, as a, as a historian, I can't help be uh, admire that people are interested in history, but maybe not, not, not Putin. But what's most interesting, I think, about that lecture was how he ends. He says... Uh, Russia and Ukraine have a very complex history, and I'm open to, to a dialogue to resolve these. And then he says, but the way this will be resolved, his last sentence, if I'll quote it, um, is, actually, I can't read my own writing without my glasses on, uh, <laughs> what Ukraine will be is up to its own citizens to decide. And what he meant by that is that Ukraine is given a choice, would absolutely want to join Russia. Right? They would want to join the Third Rome. They'd want to stand up against homosexuality. They'd want to stand up because of the Nazi instinct that they want to align with the fascists in Russia. Right? That all works quite well. So the Russian miscalculation is not just about miscalculating the Western response. It's the deep miscalculation about how the world actually looks. And I mean, we're not here to talk about China this evening, but that, that I think, important configuration about what is it that intellectuals, politicians, military leaders have been fed for the last 30 years, of how they understand the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm. how they understand the post-Cold War period, and how they look at things like oligarchs who've all owned property here and yachts all over the Mediterranean, how, they, how that's seen and understood by not just kleptocrats and oligarchs themselves, but by normal, normal Russians and what was once the Russian middle class that's now I, I'm a great fan of Orlando Fajus, your book, The Russia Story, yep. um, which is not a history of Russia. What Orlando Fajas, is, for whom I think knows as much about Russia as anybody in Britain, and he argues in this book, it's a short book, and it's simply an account of how Russians have portrayed their own history and their own past over the centuries. And his essential thesis is that Russians have been inventing and reinventing a narrative about themselves, which most of the rest of us wouldn't recognized for a moment, since about the 17th century. And above all, because Russia has no natural land um, or sea frontiers, that successive Russian leaders from um, uh, Peter the Great through Catherine the Great uh, through Stalin and so on, have been constantly seeking to redefine, the, to demand the right to decide where Russia's rightful frontiers lie. And that's a right that most of us in, in this hall tonight would agree we cannot possibly concede. But um, essentially Orlando's point is that Putin is simply the latest in a long line of Russian leaders who demanded this right to say, I say, this is where the frontiers of Russia belong. And this is terrifying. Margaret, as a historian, does it surprise, appall, or delight that Putin spends his time using history to well, try and make his Well, he uses it case? so badly, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> you know, he's, he takes it, I think, very seriously. He used to go every summer, I don't, he perhaps isn't doing it now, to conferences of history teachers and tell them that they must teach young Russians the correct patriotic history. And I did read the essay that he wrote in 2020. And if I'd been grading it, because I'm a very kind person, I would have probably given it a D and said, <laughs> you made a lot of effort here, and you, you, know, you did write this many words. But quite frankly, uh, it's not very good. Um, knowing what I know today, I would fail it. Um, but it, it is, he, he has woven an historical narrative. And I think we didn't take it seriously enough. I, I heard Fiona Hill, who also knows a great deal of Russia, who was the, for her pains, was, was the uh, Russia advisor in, in the Trump White House. And she has some very interesting stories about that as well, which she said you mustn't tell anyone. Of course, we've all been telling everyone. But, um, but what she said about Putin was that he thinks in his own historical framework, and I think you mentioned this, Peter, that he thinks back, and you did, Max, he goes back beyond the 17th century. He goes back into this history, which seems to him to prove, and in some ways it's very like the nationalist histories of the 19th and 20th centuries. It assumes there was always something called the Russian people that exists through eternity. And the Ukrainians were always part of this spiritual unity with, with Russia. And we know that's not how history works. The nations come and go. They define themselves in different ways. And there was no Russia um, when Kiev, Kiev and Rus was set up. There was no Russia. There, was, there, there, was, there wasn't even a Muscovy. Mm. And, but he sees this, some, uh, this eternal progression through history. And I think it does affect the way he sees the world. And he also has been very influenced by these right-wing 
Russian theorists who argue that the Russians are much more spiritual than the rest of the world, that they are this Eurasian power which unites Asia and, and Europe, that they are, there's one theory, I think, I forget which one it is, um, that where all, each race is created by cosmic rays. I mean, I think Putin may believe this, and the Russian cosmic ray came last, and so the Russians are the most vigorous and youngest. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> Peter. Well, and another thing that Fiona Hill has talked about is that, that we all had our lockdown projects, and uh, Putin's, apart from studying history, was spending time in the map room in the Kremlin, looking at the ways in which Russia's borders have changed over time, and thinking, well, if, you know, history doesn't stay still. You know, empires, they rise, they fall, or they move. And so he developed a slightly different, I think, view about what, what, what a strong man or what a great leader can do to, to, to change those borders. I mean, the kind of interesting, I guess, one of the interesting questions about all of this is, because we failed, or because the system failed, or because the circumstances were as they were in 2014, um, effectively Russia took control over the main regions that it really needed access to, so Crimea, but also the parts of, of Donbass, Donetsk, and, and Luhansk. If Putin had done what a sen sane, sensible, non-opportunist would have done, was to say, I'm gonna lock that in, and we'll take two or three generations, and eventually, the process of time will be such that you know it's unrecoverable, military force, we get rid of the crazies who will run around in military fatigues, we'll have some form of either, whether it's appointed governors or whether it's a, his strong man or whatever it was, he could have formalized it. The question is, what was the point in trying to accelerate this? And once it was clear on day three that the battle plan wasn't working, what was it he wants next? I mean, he, so he, again, in the same essay, he calls Kiev the mother of Russian cities. So it's quite hard to see how he scrolls back and retires to Sochi or detaches and says, well, if that's the mother of Russian cities, how can it be outside Russian hands? Which is very similar to how she talks about Taiwan, as a matter of fact. You have drawn us into the next topic, which is the end of this. You mentioned Fiona Hill, Margaret. She said the worst piece is a recipe for more war. How do you speculate on this ending? Well, that's always the problem with wars. Um, those who start them don't think enough about the endings, um, and we're not all thinking enough about what comes next. I mean, there's some attempt being made. Um, the Germans are sponsoring a Congress, a conference in Berlin to talk about what happens when peace comes, which I think is really important. Um, we were talking about this a bit in, in the green room, and the, and the, the, the terrifying thing, and, and the Unfortunately, I think something that is very likely is we'll end with a frozen conflict, and Putin has a number of frozen conflicts around his borders, where Ukraine is constantly worrying about what's happening over in the east, constantly worrying about subversion, constantly worrying about hacking attacks, constantly worrying about misinformation, um, disinformation, worrying about internal subversion, and is kept off balance and is unable to do the, the I mean, the huge job now of rebuilding Ukraine, which, you know, goodness, you, I can't even imagine how this is going to be funded and how this is going to take place. And that, I think, is, is the dangerous thing, that the conflict won't be settled. It will remain like this open sore, draining Ukraine of resources and, and causing continual instability. On the slightly more cheerful side, um, it may be that Russia is going to be less capable of causing international damage. I mean, if Putin has done one thing, uh, well, apart from creating a much stronger Ukrainian nationalism. I mean, he should be regarded as one of the fathers of Ukrainian independence, I think. Um, but if he's done one thing which he didn't intend to do, he has much reduced the power and influence and authority of Russia in the world. And Russia more and more looks like a dependent of China, which is, I'm sure, not what he intended when it all started. Peter, the end. Have you speculated, have you pondered it, how this ends? Well, Margaret's so eloquent. I mean, the right thing, in, as any student knows, is to shut up when you're in the presence of greatness <laughs> and not, not say anything. So I, I've got very little I can add that will make me look anything apart from, you know, clearly it's Putin not being in position, however that might happen. I mean, I think there's no question that Putin can be part of any form of settlement. But it's much, much deeper than all of that. I mean, if you've been watching, and they've been, you know, social media is great to be able to show to the outside world what's being said on Russian TV every night. I mean, it's, it's pure poison about the way in which, you know, commentators, regular Joes who've never picked up a rifle talk about the use of nuclear weapons and, you know, and attacks on, outside, you know, on, other, on, other, on other, other parts of the world. So it's quite hard to see how one rose back from this. I mean, as Margaret said, when we think this through, I mean, if, if, if that U Ukrainian advance continues as it looks like it might do, as you know, and I suppose we should hope that it does, if a full Ukrainian recovery of Donbass, maybe Crimea has a separate category and we can discuss that, 
you know, who, who goes to live there? I mean, it's quite hard to see how Ukrainians yeah. who come out will want yeah. to be resettled to a frontier region. Yeah. And the, the big long-term tactical advantage that Russia has is that it can unfreeze whenever it wants. And the only way which we can have skin in that game is, as in the Cold War, to invest very heavily in our military and, to, and also to invest very sensibly in our military. Just giving money isn't very helpful. I mean, I did something with, with Mike Mullen, who was the previous chair of the Joint Chiefs of the US Armed Forces a, a few years ago, in, or th before the pandemic. And he said the single best thing the United States could do is to cut the US defense budget. Because if you have $680 billion a year to spend, you need to find a home for it. And that encourages you to use it and encourages you to get involved in, at that time, mm. Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and so on. So the, the, the long-term solution is it's really hard to see. You know, I know there's lots of chatter, particularly in the States, about potential dissolution of Russia, civic unrest. Mm. There's zero sign of that on the ground so far as anybody can see. It helps that you control the media, helps you can round up young men and throw them into the army. I mean, this afternoon we've seen um, you know, on Russian telegram channels, newly drafted Russian forces wearing inflatable body armor, right? That I looks, like, looks like body armor, but actually is like a, like a life vest that you mm. keeps a child afloat being sent to the front line. So presumably at some point there comes some response from those men and their families, as there was in Afghanistan. That's what really brought the Soviet Union down to, to pull out of Afghanistan in, in, in the end of the 80s. Before we get to the, the, the bad bits, and the ending is always difficult to talk about, mm. um, I do think we can all hang on to one really good thing, and that is back in February and March, an awful lot of people were terrified that Ukraine was simply going to be wiped off the map by Russia. Now, the one thing we can say with near certainty is that the only outcome of this, this war that is not going to happen is, is a Russian victory, that Ukraine is going to continue to exist. So that is the good news, and we should always hang tightly to the good news. Um, what's much more difficult, as um, we talked, there was a very good essay in the American uh, magazine Foreign Affairs um, by an, an American economist who said, as you touched on a moment ago, Margaret, the difficult part is you said, even if... Um, the Russian army can't beat the Ukrainians, uh, that Russia can make Ukraine an unbelievably horrible place to live and work in. And when we're told that it will take, cost about 500 billion to put Ukraine back together again, the Russians aren't going to pay that. Now, I personally, and I've been accused of being um, a defeatist nor an appeaser by saying this, I should be very surprised if any outcome gets the Russians out of the Crimea. Um, but, I, but I also think, and I think we all ought to be thinking about this, we're going to have to find ways of getting, securing some guarantees for Ukraine out of any ending of this war that prevents the Russians from doing it again. And I do think we're going to have to think very seriously about something we didn't think about before, whether Ukraine should be admitted to NATO. First of all, it seems right that the Russians should have to pay a price for the ghastly things they've done there. Secondly, unless one does offer some security guarantees, what's to stop the Russians starting this up again any time they feel like? And, but none of these are easy because, for example, France and Germany, well, absolutely, they will be horrified at any notion of um, Ukraine belonging to NATO. But I think the things we must think about, how are we going to find the money in Europe and the United States to put Ukraine together again, and how are we going to stop the Russians from doing this again? The answers aren't easy, but we can at least try and pose the right questions at this point. Margaret, you mentioned frozen conflicts, and there's a number around the world, some closer, some further away from Europe. Do they ever unfreeze? And if they do, how? Well, they unfreeze if one side decides to turn them into a hot war, which is, is always the danger, which is what happened in, in Ukraine. They can be mediated. Um, at the moment, talk of an international community seems a bit optimistic. Um, you know, the UN, which has so often played a part in, in trying to mediate conflict and, and coming in for reconstruction in, in post-conflict situations, I think is, is much weaker than it was. And the fact that, that both China and Russia have vetoes on the Security Council limits, I think, the effectiveness of what, what it can do. But yes, we know that conflict can be overcome. We know that peace can be made. I mean, if you had been predicting in 1945 that Russia and Germany would be working with each other and would the, the, Russian, the, the, the German chancellor and the, and the French president would meet and, and shake hands on the border and, and exchange you know, greetings, you, you, we would have said impossible. And so things can change, but how they change without 
a good deal of outside intervention, I think, is, is tricky. Because the trouble is that so often in, in conflicts, those in power have a vested interest in, in maintaining them, if, if not turning them into open conflicts. But it's, it's, it's a way of maintaining status. So I'm not very optimistic about what's going to happen in the case of particularly the Ukraine if those conflicts become frozen again. And Peter, can I ask you about other external actors here? I mean, we, we, we heard the rumblings <laughs> of it. Was it at the Shanghai Cooperation Council where there was what, uh, clearly an expression of concern from India and China about what was going on? Do you see any role there? Well, Max has given a shout out to his book, so it'd be rude for me not to give out a shout out to mine. <laughs> if you, if you were, books are uh, plenty, I promise you. If you were ever interested in thinking that maybe the Silk Road, there's something in it, um, the, uh, in September, we had in um, Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and then in Samarkand, uh, the leader of China, India, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, the Pope, uh, you know, all South Asian countries, uh, all gathering, Afghanistan to representatives. And, and I think that that... that, that like a lot of clubs, uh, exists for compromise reasons. It's, these are lots of marriages of convenience that are very messy and difficult. There's almost nothing that any of these countries really have in common, apart from some, some very light glue that, hold, that, that, that the narrative is important. And the narrative for many of them that's very persuasive is the West has had it too good for too long. You know, yeah. uh, we colonize parts of the world from Europe. Uh, we are much richer than other parts of Europe. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether the structural and major problems, economic, social, and political... The narrative of grievance. That's right. And, and, and also in fact as well. I mean, that's, it's also in fact. I mean, the reason we're richer in this part of the world is because we did do quite well out of other continents, whether we gave them railways, cricket, and God knows what else. You know, we built the, the, the industrialized West, managed to rise on the fact that it able, was able to get resources cheaply from other parts of the world. I think that's just how it is. Uh, having said that, many of the countries that I just mentioned have been free and master their own destiny for quite a long time now. So it's how do you how do you have a script? And historians, that's what we're also about, is having a narrative arc that explains why we are as we are. So that meeting in Samarkand was hugely important because it was, pre it was the optics were, this is a world without the West. This is where 65% of the world's population live east of Istanbul. We have between us you know, significant energy needs and, 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 uh, and resources. And we should shape the world in the way we want. And that starts by not taking orders from the West. When you get into one level below that, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Uh, it's more complicated. And what was very important about the Shanghai team was, was two things. First, some of the heads of smaller states, like Kyrgyzstan, kept Putin waiting. And uh, that doesn't get done either by chance, nor does it get done without consultation with one big power in your corner behind you that you're sure of. And I'm not going to give you too many guesses for which one <laughs> that might be. So that architecture of what is happening in Eurasia has been fundamentally changed. And of course, the second thing was that both um, Xi and also Modi spoke up and said, this is not the time for war. Um, you know, you should go back home and find a way of being peaceful without giving too much of a roadmap. But you, you can see that what Russia has done by reducing its own global standing, by executing a badly executed war, if nothing else, and having no exit that's obvious in terms of how do you reintegrate and whatever, however good or bad a settlement might look like, that sets a bad example for these countries that have traditionally not looked for Russia for alliances and friendships and strategic importance. We, we read a lot into that. We think that the Russian and Chinese axis is something real. Mm. You know, this is a marriage of convenience that, that suits uh, one side probably more than it suits the other. But what Russia has done is it's shown this not competent reading the global tea leaves. And that, that is as, as dramatic as the economic damage that's happened to Russia and so on and, and, and is coming towards us. So, that, that Central Asian meeting in Samarkand of all these great powers was a real sort of turning point, I think. And what we'll see now is what is it that Asia means for the peoples of Asia. In fact, this, this evening on the way here, uh, Biden has said he's not going to turn up to the Asia Pacific Economic Conference because he's going to go to his granddaughter's wedding instead. Mm -hmm. And although that's a sort of highly superficial, um, it, the optics of that are that the West is detaching itself, the United States have, have other things to do than to be getting involved in places like Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, you know, countries that have populations, Pakistan, population of more than 230 million people. And their futures are also highly dependent on energy prices. They don't have a Jeremy Hunt who can throw money, or whoever it is in charge, uh, while, we're, while this is being <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> they don't have those safety nets. And there's real anxiety, I think, about what is coming towards us, particularly as proper sanctions kick in on 6th of December. So that, that world looks solid. There is, a gro there is a sort of push towards unity. I mean, the BRICS countries, China, Brazil, India, all abstained from the vote to, to, to condemn Russia for its annexations of Ukraine. So that, you know, we should take that all quite seriously. My own view, for what it's worth, is we need ministers in the air 
going to visit these places all the time rather than sitting here working out which seat they're going to be in tomorrow. You know, we don't, we don't invest enough in our international relationships, partly because Brexit, I'm afraid, is part of that story, partly because we expect and we've learned over the last 30, 40 years, if we sit here, people will turn up and do business with us in London. And, you know, if we want to, ha do we want to keep our Security Council seat, do we want to be a global power? And, you know, Max, you're right, it is an American war run from the Pentagon, but the British Armed Forces have been absolutely first rate uh, through this process too. There are some things we do in this country, universities too, that we really do incredibly well. And it's how do we play a role in shaping some of those conversations? Because before I'll finish with that, you know, mm. all, lots of these times that I, there are events in Samarkand or Kazakhstan that I go to, I'm almost always the only European, in, I'm always the only Brit in the room, but almost always the only European. And it needs people to be studying, spending time, meeting, listening, wondering what it is that people want. And we haven't done that particularly well in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. And that's given people like Lavrov quite a lot of collateral to play with to say, look what the West do. We're coming with a different solution. Could we suggest that since the end of the Cold War, um, an awful lot of societies in the West, notably including Britain, have allowed us ourselves the luxury of what I would call frivolity, um, including choosing unbelievably frivolous leaders. I would, suggest, I would suggest that we've now entered a new era in which um, we've got to get serious again, in which, and I'm not just talking about the local domestic issues, one is thinking of issues like the Ukraine war, climate change, all the rest of it. We have got to rediscover the capacity to be a serious country and to be led by serious politicians instead of comics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, that brings us to an end of the bit where I throw questions um, at this brilliant panel and towards the bit where you throw questions or put questions to them. Um, questions uh, from the standing microphones. You can see them there and there, and I can see one perched up there on the gallery. I will try and come to the gallery, I promise, um, although it makes me squint. And also from our online audience as well. We have one question coming in. Please feel free, if you are at home and watching this online, use the space beneath the screen to put your question to me, and it will, or to our panel rather, not to me, I, I have no answers, um, and they will attempt to answer them. I'm going to go first to the standing microphone here, if you would, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Nelson Mandela famously said that history is not made by kings and generals, it's made by masses of ordinary men and women. Rather than paying tribute to President Biden, should we not in fact be paying tribute to the inspirational struggle by masses of ordinary men and women in Ukraine who are going to defeat this murderous war and in so doing are going to inspire working people in Russia to themselves put paid to the Putin secret police regime? Thank you very much, sir. Um, the general point there, history made by the masses, history made by the leaders and the elites, Max? I think, one, I think it, the two are not mutually exclusive. I'm quite sure that everybody in this hall shares admiration for the extraordinary fortitude and courage of um, the Ukrainians, but that does not exclude we should not take anything for granted, and I certainly will not dare take for granted. Ukraine would not still exist, but with the support of the United States, the United States has had at least one president in recent years who would not have given such support, and I do not apologize for thinking that we should be extraordinarily grateful to the current president. Yeah, I think also, well, the point, I mean, it's an, it's an absolutely fair, fair, fair punch. Uh, we should also absolutely be talking about the, the determination of the Ukrainian people and the, and the leadership of, of, of Volodymyr Zelensky to, uh, to defend their homeland. You know, and I think that we have that experience too here in the Second World War too, what it means to go and fight for your country. It's a, it's a hugely powerful thing to, to do and to see. And the, and the determination, courage of uh, the Ukrainian people to stand in line and fight rather than uh, accept uh, Russian overlordship, I think is, it has been hugely inspiring. And it's, 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 I think, a fair point that we can take that for granted by thanking people outside. But I think we take as a given that you stand and defend your family and homes. No, and I think Max is, is right. You could, the two things are not mutually exclusive. I mean, Churchill said to the Americans during the Second World War, one of the darkest times for Britain, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. You can't do the job unless you have the tools. And so 
if there had been a different president in the White House, it is quite possible if Trump had been in office, those tools would not have come to Ukraine. And no matter how brave the Ukrainian soldiers are, and they are very brave, and, and they have shown tremendous skill and, and daring and tactical and, and strategic um, brilliance, however good they were without the tools, they couldn't have done it. Okay. Sir. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, if we look at um, the current situation, one man thinks that the true um, destiny of Russia is to control the, the rich farmlands and the water port of Ukraine. Others may think that the real uh, asset that Russia has to protect is Siberia, its oil riches and so on, and that is actually at risk. We have the historical precedent of the Khrushchev solution. Is there any way of looking underneath the bonnet and understanding the forces at play here amongst the Russian elites and how that might, may work, because removing Putin, sending him to Sochi, allows Russia to withdraw and pivot to protecting its current very valuable assets in the East. Who wants to take that on first? Who you thought? I would have thought. Well, I don't think there's any military strategic threat to any Russian assets in Siberia or anywhere else, so um, I don't think that's an issue. I think the, the bigger problem for Putin now is to exploit Arctic natural resources, which you can't do without Western capital and technology and know-how. So I don't think that the pivot away from Ukraine opens up other areas where Russia has exposure. I don't, I don't recognize that at all. No, and what Russia has lost is the people who could exploit the oil and gas in the, in, in the East. I mean, they've lost so many of their highly educated people. Um, it's, you know, it's been, and, you, and they're still losing them. And this is going to be a serious problem for Russia in the long run. They've, they've lost some of their most educated people, and then you can't replace them easily. Okay. So I want to go up, up, up to the gallery. I am informed that there are people there, despite the <laughs> blazing lights. Yeah, there uh, they is are. there someone at the microphone? Um, can you hear me? Okay, good evening. Um, may I ask the apparent um, stalemate or something close to it, which will be the end of this war, maybe with this buffer zone, how would Putin possibly sell this at home, specifically now that more recruits are going into the war, possibly badly equipped, and more deaths are occurring? How can Putin sell this to his own people as a victory? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I mean, can a stalemate be sold um, at the end of a war like this? What, is, what does it do to his own position um, within Russia? I mean, he has sold an image of himself as the wise, the powerful leader who is victorious, if he were now to say, um, we've got a stalemate, um, we've lost a lot of lives, we've lost the bulk of our military equipment, we're looking, our military is looking pretty foolish, I think his own position in, in Russia would become very difficult indeed. I think he's got no choice now but to go for victory. Well, if you, if you, if you control the press, you can sell anything as a victory. Mm. You know, I mean, that's the big advantage of the organs of propaganda. So, I mean, at the beginning of the war, the Russian, Russian uh, public opinion, insofar as it could be measured in Pew Research, which is, you know, as good as one can get in terms of scraping the data, uh, there was huge popularity for what, what Putin was doing. It showed that Russia was able to stand up on the global stage. And in fact, 85% of people who were surveyed, and it's not my research, not my work, not my views, um, believe that Russia should go for Poland next. That that has now all so far as we can see, dissipated. But, you know, point made by uh, other Russian commentators is that we've seen no ambassadorial defections. We've seen no one switch sides. We've seen no one in the Russian high command look like that they have disobeyed orders. Um, it looks like people are fair, fair square behind. So how this gets sold, if it's a bad result, is that Russia wasn't fighting Ukraine, it's fighting the West, which is what it looks like. And that Putin will say his, that Russian time will come. And for now, we will take stock, rebuild our military and go again. And, and that, that, I think, is, takes us back to the frozen war. And how do we then find a way? But it's not for us to find an off-ramp for him. It's not for us to find a solution that he can sell or work out. It probably doesn't help that we have prominent private citizens in the United States in particular proposing peace settlements that, that they think would work for the Ukrainian people. This has got to come from a settlement that looks right for Zelensky and the people of Ukraine. I had an experience um, 20 years ago uh, when I was working quite a lot in Russia and interviewing veterans of World War II. And my very sophisticated, uh, very liberal Russian researcher, um, she told me in Moscow, and this was just after 9-11, and she said, most of the people that one meets in Moscow, um, they're absolutely delighted about 9-11. They think the Americans had it coming. They think they've been so arrogant for so long, and they love to see them in the ship. And I was shocked at the time to hear this said, but it gave me an insight 
into the depth of this Russian narrative of grievance and victimhood and the degree of resentment, um, which I think, I mean, we find it almost incomprehensible that Putin should have any residual support at all in Russia. For, and yet there's so many Russians who this um, hatred and resentment of the West and this desire to see us put down and our arrogance punished and so on. And I think it's a very real ongoing force. But, Peter, you're more up to date than I am about this. I I think that's right. It's a source of of great mystery to me because, you know, Russia is a beautiful country and Mm. the people are fantastically creative, interesting, dynamic, energetic. But this is what happens when you don't have institutions that protect absolute power. And I think we should be grateful for the fact that in this country and other places, for all of the mudslinging that politicians do, those institutions do function. But we shouldn't take those for granted, too. I think the the problem with with authoritarian autocratic rule is that either you go mad at some point or you get power hungry or there's no sort of there's no crown prince to Putin. If there was a succession line, then you could open up discussions with who might follow next. And we've shown that quite well for all the things we've done wrong in this country. So they're quite well with. Her Majesty died of, of seeing that transition to happen smoothly. And that, that is something we should be thinking about also in the case of, of China and you, because I've mentioned China quite a, a yeah. few times tonight, about, about understanding how other people see us. Because it, like you said, Max, it comes as a real shock to see how we're perceived, because that's not how we see ourselves. We see that we're tolerant, we don't get everything right, we try to do things the right way, we welcome people to come and buy our football clubs and our apartments and push the price, house the price up that, that works if you happen to buy a house at the right time, doesn't help young people. Mm. But I think that, that that idea of of what now comes next uh, asks very fundamental questions about Russia. I am acutely aware that people are queuing at the microphones, and I have not forgotten you. However, there are also people popping questions in uh, online, and I want to go to some of those, or at least one of those. A remarkable number about the end of the the war to come. You can't cheat, Max, by looking at the questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, um, and again, this 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 suggestion that an off-ramp, a a, a way should be found uh, to allow Russia and and Vladimir Putin to uh, have peace with honour. From Camilla Redfern, uh, how can the war in Ukraine be ended with both sides believing that they are winners? Margaret, shaking your head at the thought of it. No, I think the war can't be ended by anyone except the Ukrainians and the Russians. And the idea that the rest of us can somehow go in and say, we are here to dispense peace and, and friendship, we can't do it. And actually, I'm not sure we have the moral right to do it, but I don't think we have the influence to do it. I mean, what is happening, and this happens in wars, it's on the ground. What happens on the ground is going to play a very large part. Outside powers can can help, they can perhaps mediate, but in most wars, when outside powers offer to mediate, they're told to buzz off. Um, You know, I just don't see that we we have to understand that it's up to the Ukrainians and the Russians. And that's why I think what's going to happen in the next few months is going to be extremely important. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go to the questioner here, if you would, sir. Thank you. Um, just to be clear, yeah, not, not my view, but what do you make of the Russia apologists in, in Western Europe or in the US who say, well, Russia was justified in their invasion because, well, Hitler and Napoleon both came through Ukraine. We attacked through Crimea in the past. So Russia was justified. Away from the, the crap history essay that Putin wrote, he was justified to protect himself. What do you make of those apologists? What, what do you make of the, the, the apologists, uh, the, the way that our question phrases it, the apologists within the West who say that there was a justification to this war? I'm afraid I think a lot of them um, in the mainland, there are fewer in Britain than there are in Europe. Yeah. But I'm sorry to say that I think that an awful lot of Europeans in the last 30 years have given up on security. And... Putin is right about some of them, and some of those who are saying, well, we must see the Russian side of this, are saying this because they don't want the gas to be turned off. And it is going to be a huge challenge this winter, especially, uh, maintaining uh, the unity of the West. And of course, all the time, this is Putin's calculation all the way through. He believes that we are weak. He believes that our unity will crack. And as soon as the lights start going off, um, that the West is going to be... support for um, for Ukraine is going to be ebbing away. And it's going to be jolly difficult to keep it going. But of course, we have to keep it going. But I'm afraid it's heartbreaking. I mean, uh, that uh, I was um, speaking in Holland at the weekend. And I did ask some of the highly intelligent, sophisticated Dutch people who I was talking to about their view about security. 
has Holland, has Germany, um, have they started to get serious about security? The answer is still, just look how many weapons Germany has delivered to Ukraine so far. Almost none. They promised quite a few. They've delivered almost none. Um, how many weapons the Italians, the French, the French behavior, I dare I say it. And I speak as a Francophile, but the French uh, pusillanimity about Ukraine has been despicable, is despicable. So it's a very difficult issue, um, and it's going to be very tough um, keeping, maintaining uh, European unity on this crisis. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see, because the one thing in the Cold War, that it's amazing how well um, NATO solidarity and European solidarity held together. And it is a challenge. If Putin was allowed to emerge as a winner from all this, it would be a generational catastrophe for, for us all. Okay. Well, there's also, I think, it's in the U.S. you see it. There are those who admire power and admire Putin. Um, Tucker Carlson, that um, ornament of your profession, um, <laughs> says, you know, that Putin is a man. Putin is vigorous. Putin knows what to do. And so, I'm afraid there's probably, as as there was in, in Britain and France before the Second World War, there was yeah. an admiration for those who are decisive and seem to be strong. There's, there's, I've mentioned gender before, but there is a sort of element. I don't want to overplay it, but there's an element of an admiration for what are seen as masculine qualities. And, the amazing thing about it all is that, like Hitler, Putin is unbelievably indecisive, right? I mean, it's the terrible crisis of leadership. You can't work out what you should do, so you micromanage, you interfere, and you choose both options every single time, and that's part of the strategic problem and weakness. Thank you. Let's go back upstairs, if we may. And again, I, I'm squinting into the light, so who's next to a microphone? Um, Madam. Um, I just wanted to draw on something that Mr. Hastings said earlier about um, America and the deliverance of weapons and NATO. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think one of the um, commitments of NATO when it was founded was a 2% spending of the GDP on defense. And pretty much none of the countries that are a part of NATO except the USA, spend that amount of money on defence. And I was wondering if you thought that if um, the like European countries, such as the UK, Germany, started to spend that sort of money on defence, we would have a better, like, stabilised ground to be able to deal with such crises as when they arise. Uh, I'll, I'll pick it just because Sir Max is what's it, you know, about, about NATO and GDP spending. Um, interestingly, there are countries that spend not just the, the, the specified amount, but more. It's like Croatia and the Baltic states. Uh, Trump, for the, all the madness and all the disruption, was absolutely right that NATO countries in Europe are getting a free ride and they're not investing in their security, particularly uh, Germany, where for a considerable period of time there were no, not a single military helicopter able to take to the air. Um, and, and Trump was right about Nord Stream providing dependency on Russian gas as well. So if you assume that the world is all going to run in your favor, and you assume you don't need to spend on defense, or you assume that you don't need the gas storage that we used to have in this country that we shut down because we thought we'd always be able to rely on a stable world, then the problem is like with a pandemic. If you don't invest in your critical facilities, when something bad happens, you have to spend 40 times more. So uh, that should be a, a few lessons that, that perhaps are politicians will talk of, as it, as it happens, uh, Prime Minister Truss, if she's still in charge this evening, I, I do uh, has, has promised a 3% expenditure, which amongst the many things she's promised. I, I've yet to see whether that's one of the things that's also going to be scrapped. The only thing you've said... I said that seriously, not as a The joke. only thing you've said tonight, Peter, that I haven't agreed with, you <laughs> paid just tribute to um, our armed forces. But we have to keep reminding ourselves our armed forces are ridiculously small. And they've been allowed, since the end yes. of the Cold War, they've been run down to an extraordinary level. We've depleted our own um, inventories of weapons we can send to Ukraine. We're training Ukrainians here. But we should be in no doubt that um, the, the biggest danger uh, of the size of our armed forces, uh, you know, somebody said to me, what, what will the Chinese uh, do if we sail our aircraft carriers through the South China Sea? I said the biggest danger for the Chinese is they die laughing because um, the idea, we, we, we have allowed this, we should not delude ourselves about our own armed forces. Um, We've had a terrific wake-up call, a terrifying wake-up call, and we've got to spend a lot more money, and that is not going to be popular. No, none of our leaders, yes, Liz Truss has said we've got to raise um, defence spending 3%. Nobody's really talked through the implications about what we're going to... But yeah. if we're serious about security, we've got to spend the money. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I will come back to the audience here. I want to pick up on a question. I think 
particularly to Margaret, if I may, um, that's come in online. Um, how do you think the war will shape future societies or relations between nations? Do you think there's a potential for a return to an Iron Curtain type situation or state in years to come? Is it too early to start calling that one, Margaret? Wars do leave, d depending on the nature of the war, and they, they do leave often very great scars and, and, and great consequences. I think for countries not directly involved in the war, we will move on um, and perhaps tend to forget it, although we will have, I think, in the West. And the West, I should say, is, is not really a geographical term. It's, it's a term of encompassing like my cultural. cultural. Yeah. I mean, Japan's part of the West, <laughs> Australia's part of the West. So, you know, it's the, the, but I think countries which <laughs> adhere to democratic values, constitutional government, rule of law, <laughs> will, after this war, regard Russia with a lot more suspicion, I think. And I think what the war has done, if it's done anything good, is forced peoples in the West to define what it is they think is important and what values they think are important. What it will do to the relations between Ukrainians and Russians, it's hard to see that these will become anything but bitter in the next, you know, it'll take at least a generation. And the more that comes out about how Russian troops have been behaving in Ukraine, I think the more difficult it's going to be for Ukrainians to forgive. And the Russians, if they end up with, with a defeat, are going to be humiliated. And humiliation is not also a good basis for making friends with your neighbors. We're doomed to be in an adversarial relation with them. Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, you know, in Putin's essay, he, he says the Russians, Ukrainian are brothers. And we've, we've all had pretty tasty Christmases where things kick off. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it's, it's quite hard to see how you come back from that. If this is the way you treat the people who you regard and you write detailed histories to say, we're born from the same mother, we're all the same people, it, it's, a, it's a pretty bad position to be in if you're Russian, to try to think, how do we undo this? As Margaret said, the behavior of the troops on the ground, Max has said, on the behavior of the troops on the ground, has been absolutely abysmal, looting dishwashers and so on. And that, that's been seen around the world. You know, that's not, 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 not a particularly positive sign for the long term. Margaret, for 30 years, we thought that trade would change yeah. countries that, whose systems of government we didn't believe in or, or, or that we were opposed to previously. That doesn't appear to have been the case. There's always been this illusion that the more you trade together, the more you're going to like each other. Um, it doesn't work out that way the whole time. Quite often, you, you get jealous. You, you don't like the fact your markets are being cut into. Look, Britain and Germany were each other's greatest trading partners before the First World War. And they should have been friends. And, and Norman Angel wrote a very persuasive book. I mean, people studied it. And, and people set up groups like this to study angelism. Um, and Norman Angel argued that because European economies, so, economies were so tightly intertwined, there could be no war. It wouldn't make sense. War is not something that is always rational. And uh, the, all, you know, it's the same argument that a lot of people have made with China. The closer that we get to China economically, the, closer, the more intertwined the American and Chinese economies are, the more likely they'll be friends. Well, look at them today. Sir, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, a few weeks ago, a far-right Dutch politician stood up in Parliament and said he thanked Putin for opening a new front against globalism, the World Economic Forum, George Soros, and the American Deep State. And this is palpably ridiculous, obviously, but it makes me wonder, is there something exportable about the Russian ideology, the way Marxism-Leninism was during the Cold War? Is it being exported? And if it is being exported, what do we do against it? Thank you very much. Margaret, can I come to you? It's being, it's being exported to countries around Russia, Serbia, for example, um, yeah. which is always had strong links with Russia, not all Serbs, and I don't want to suggest that all Serbs think this, but there certainly is a strand in Serbian politics, which is, and, and you see it in Hungarian politics as well. Um, you know, the, there are some of the ideas of, of and, and you referred, I mean, there are these conspiracy theories that George Soros somehow and the World Economic Forum, among them, run the world. Um, and this appeals, I think, to people who feel powerless. I can, you know, conspiracy theories tend to do that. But I don't, I think I see Russia actually as, as, as an importer of, of ideas as well. I mean, it's imported fascist ideas. It's imported ideas of the nation, um, the eternal nation. I mean, I think it's a two-way street. Max, I think one think thing, that? one historical lesson that um, is worth mentioning, um, Churchill in 1940, at a time when Britain was entirely beleaguered, and uh, one evening at Chequers, um, a whole group of ministers and uh, his staff were all talking about Germany and agreeing that um, all sorts of terrible things had got to be done to Germany uh, after its defeat, um, which um, at that time seemed very remote. And Britain was completely embattled, and Britain was losing.
Um, and Churchill intervened after he listened to some of this, and he said, no, 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 all this talk about pastoralizing Germany and so on. So, well, he said Germany was part of the European community of nations uh, before Hitler came, and it must be again. And I thought it was an example of Churchill at his absolute best, that in those desperate days, in, I forget, June or July 1940, he could display the, the compassion and the generosity to envisage a future in which Germany would come back. And in the same way, I guess we have to be optimistic enough to hope that one day Russia may come back. Bloody difficult at the moment. Um, but nonetheless, I do remember that example of Churchill's, which part of his generosity of spirit and it's very hard to display generosity of spirit in the middle of a war as ghastly as this one. Peter, can I put something to you that's coming online? And, mm. and, and whilst I, I'm sure the panel disagrees, and many in the audience may completely, it, it's a common theme of questioning and uh, of point making. Um, what do you answer? What do you say to people who believe the West provoked Russia by wanting Ukraine to join the EU and NATO? Well, the EU didn't court Ukraine. It's what Ukraine wants. It's up to the EU to decide whether they want to admit them. So I'm sort of slightly, you know, it's, I, I'm very happy to bash the West for all sorts of sins. But I think we have to be slightly constructive about allowing self-determination. When people want to join NATO or EU, then the institutions have the right to work out whether they should be admitted and what the risks are. And clearly, Ukraine is a sensitive issue. I think that all military strategists and you know, sensible politicians have understood that it's a sensitive issue through the dark days of uh, revolutions in, in Ukraine in the last um, decade in particular in terms of what that meant for strategic importance. And the signaling from the West has been pretty clear that we understand that it's an issue, that parking missiles and, and so on in Ukraine is not going to be acceptable for, for Russia. And there was no proposal that that would happen. But it, it does seem valid, doesn't it? Um, that after the Cold War, the West was in very triumphalist mode, and especially the Americans. And there's not much doubt that the Americans especially did rub the Russians' noses in their defeat Wait. in the immediate aftermath in a way that created a mindset. So I totally agree that um, one thing the Russians will never admit is that a sovereign nation, including Ukraine, mm -hmm. should have the right to decide whether it belongs to you. But there's no doubt we did not behave with much grace or dignity towards the Russians in the aftermath of which what, what we saw as their defeat. Margaret, sorry, you were... Well, as my mother used to say, two wrongs don't make a right. And, you know, we did make mistakes. Of course we did. Mm. But, you know, this idea that Russia was given a promise that not one inch, NATO would not expand one inch eastwards, is not true. No. Mary Surratt has written a very good book on it, if anyone wants to read it, called Not One Inch, actually. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was the countries of the former Soviet empire in Eastern Europe who wanted to get into NATO, wanted to get into the European Union, because they had lived under the alternative. Yeah, and, you know, to go back to what Max said about the Second World War, you know, I suppose if there was a single serious of the many mistakes that we made, and there were lots, you know, uh, was that we did a pretty good job in incorporating countries in Eastern Europe that had been hobbled by Warsaw Pact and Soviet rule. And that was a great virtue of the European Union and what it did to bring up standards of living, not just in uh, Eastern European countries, Central European countries, but also in Southern Europe. It made us much more inclusive and wealthier altogether. Um, and we did, by and large, all get on with each other. We still do, even though we're out of, out of that particular club here in the UK. But the one thing, perhaps the biggest regret as a, as a Russia specialist, was that when the Soviet Union dissolved in 91, we missed the chance to put in some kind of Marshall Plan for Russia. You know, we, ha we were good at bringing in Poland, Hungary, imperfectly, and so on, with all the flaws. But, you know, in fact, we, we almost did the opposite. Not only did we help support, we helped the process of looting systematically by allowing our law firms here and our structures here. You know, Britain is a, is a world-class tax haven specialist in terms of Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, and so on, that are dependence, crown dependencies, and, and so on. And we thought it was sort of amusing that people turned up with their yachts, football clubs, boats, etc., and, and the whole lot behind. And, and they arguably, maybe it was good trickle down to pro politics, or that the money doesn't really work that way. And they're against us. And they're, they're against us. And I think that because in the West, it's not hard to see, I mean, in Russia, it's not hard to see how we in the West are portrayed as being complicit in the looting of Russian, yeah. Yeah. to Russians, actually. Yeah. But, but there was no mm -hmm. end of, of oil executives waiting to fly into Moscow. You know, if you visited Russia before all of this, you know, it was a boom town filled with chances and, and investors trying to sort of work out how to, 
take advantage of the, of the fact that it was quite easy to do business if you knew the right people, you knew the right way to do things. And we didn't encourage any of the institutional development that we not only could have done, but some of us think morally we should have done. Okay, I'm going to ask the gentleman who's been waiting very patiently there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> when this terrible invasion first took place, I remember saying that this could conceivably turn out to be Putin's Ceausescu moment. Um, and I'm really picking up on something Peter said a few minutes ago when, when he, he indicated that there were no signs of any real opposition within Russia. I wonder whether that's the case behind closed doors. And th there is a pattern in history of um, dictatorial powers simply collapsing almost overnight, especially when they face disaster, especially military disaster, when all credibility goes and all belief in them goes. Okay. And I think what we're seeing now with the humiliation of the Russian yeah. army at the hands of the extraordinary Ukrainian resistance, where the, 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 the entire Russian military machine... Okay, I'm going to put your point, I'm going to put your point if I may, to the, to the yeah. panel, if I, I may. Yes, thank you. I just yeah. wonder one, one what the members yeah. of the panel Thank you very much indeed. Margaret. Well, you're right. I think dictatorships can be fragile, and, and it's, it's a bit like the emperor's no clothes, isn't it? At a certain point, people say, wait a minute, this isn't working for us. Um, it's what's happening in Iran today. I think you're getting what started out as a protest over a young woman who was killed by the, the, by the religious police, who has sparked, her death has sparked a whole series of protests about lots of things in Iran. And, and the regime, it may survive, but it certainly is looking very much on its back foot. And what may happen, I mean, I, I heard Catherine Belton, who wrote that extraordinary book, Putin's People, talk the other day, and she said, cracks are appearing in the Russian elites. How deep they go is difficult to tell, because it's really hard to know what's going on in Russia at the moment. But there are more people speaking openly against Putin than we've seen for a very long time. And it may be that, you know, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. I mean, the best possible thing perhaps it could happen is that his regime collapsed. But the thing, we, the thing we then have to worry about is who takes over, and it may be someone even it's worse. It's unlikely to be a liberal Democrat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you could, maybe you, you've got a few spare British politicians here. You could ship some over. <laughs> um, can I ask the lady here? She's probably going to be our final question. Um, we heard your views on the lack of plausibility for a third world war, but what do you think about the notion that we're perhaps in another Cold War period? What do you think about the notion that we're in another Cold War period? Is that, is that a fair I, I don't think. It's very important to say this is not a rerun of the old Cold War, partly because this is not about ideology. There's no ideology at stake here. This is all about power and territory. Um, on the other hand, I do think, and going back to Margaret's point earlier, um, I fear that uh, despite... W we did try... Not as hard as we should have done, perhaps, but we did try to cohab cohabit reasonably peacefully with Russia and China and to get along with them. But I'm afraid it looks as if, for the time being, at least the effort has failed, and we are in an adversarial relationship. So I do think we're in a we're not in a. I think it's wrong to call it a second Cold War because it, it's not the same thing. Um, but I do think we're in an adversarial relationship with Russia and China, which, alas, is going to have to persist. And I come back. And I'm not, I hope, sabre-rattling here. I think we've got to show um, a, a recognition of the vital importance, again, to go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, that President Kennedy was able to prevail in the Cuban Missile Crisis because nobody in the Kremlin doubted that he had both the military means and the political will um, uh, to go to war if he had to. Um, and in the same way today, Putin has acted as he has because he believes that we are weak. Um, I'm afraid, I believe, we're going to have to spend a great deal of money on rearming. And if we fail to rearm, if we fail to address energy security also, um, then I think the prospects for, uh, for the West, we will have to face continuing aggression, new aggression, acts of aggression. And I'm afraid all the old cliches are true, that the price of, of, of security is vigilance and is a degree of preparedness. We had it in the Cold War. We don't have it now. We've got to get it back. Margaret, are we looking at a second Cold War? No, because I think, um, among other things about the Cold War, was that it was a war of ideologies. It was a war of competing visions of society, and we don't have that at the moment. Um, this is a war. This is a war that is much more familiar from the 18th, 17th, 16th century. It's, it's a war of aggression to seize land. Peter. 
Well, my, my mother also told me that two wrongs don't make a right, but she also said, if you haven't got anything clever to say, then shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll never make it on television, will you? Um, <laughs> I'm going to draw things to a close. We are out of time. Um, our panel have been extraordinarily generous with their time, their expertise, and their experiences. The very good news is you will be able to sample a little bit more of that outside in the foyer, where they will, for varying lengths of time, be signing books, should you wish to purchase them. But I would like to say what a complete joy it has been to share the stage with you, to share this space with all of you and those of you at home, and thank you to you all. Thank and can you we very thank much. Johnny? No, no, we no, thank no, no. Enough. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the most kind. Thank you. Peter. Great.